research and teaching concern uh, 20th century United States, uh, poverty, public policy, uh, particular focus uh, temporarily on the 1960s and 70s. She's the author of uh, More on Welfare, Family, Poverty, and Politics in Modern America, which is the University of Pennsylvania Press, uh, released in 2012. So please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Chicot. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in some senses, I'm going to pick up where uh, Professor Beatty left off and offer a brief history in particular of voting rights in the United States since the 15th Amendment. And I want to offer some parallels between past and present, as, as Tom did. And my goal really is to illuminate the precariousness of electoral democracy and the interrelated, interrelated role of racial and class politics in limiting the democratic promise. And it's a story in three chapters. So chapter one, this is just an introduction. Chapter one, an era of contraction. In the half century following the passage of the 15th Amendment, white supremacist Democrats in the South and white middle and upper class Republicans in the North and West waged a sustained and successful effort to restrict suffrage rights. Despite some regional differences, the general motivation and methods were remarkably similar. The emancipation of four million African Americans in the South created a potentially rebellious rural working class, while the influx of 25 million mostly propertyless immigrants in the North and West created a vast urban working class. Native-born white Americans viewed both groups as culturally, socially, and racially other, and as a threat to American national identity and social order. And in some ways, they were. Working class political activism from Reconstruction through World War I threatened the prerogatives of capital. African American voters, sometimes joined by working class whites, won state funding for public education, corporate regulation, and other progressive policies in the Reconstruction South. The populist movement built a biracial coalition capable, perhaps, of bringing the challenge to unregulated capitalism to national politics. Meanwhile, the Knights of Labor, the International Workers of the World, and various socialist and anarchist groups waged battles in the coal fields, on the shop floor, and industrial communities throughout the nation. Charges of fraud, corruption, and incapacity framed in racial, ethnic, and class terms justified nationwide efforts to reduce working class political power. And I have a slide here to, uh, here is, um, these are from the 1870s, the front of Harper's Weekly. This is a depiction of the um, legislature, the Reconstruction Legislature of South Carolina, which was the only Reconstruction Legislature to have a majority of African Americans. And you can see it's a racist depiction of, of that, the incapacity of African Americans. And um, on, the, on your right is a picture equating the, the problem of the South, which is the African American, to the problem of the North, which in this case is a caricature of, of an Irishman. So the point is this is a national movement, not just a southern movement. An Atlantic Monthly editorial laid out the strategy in 1879. The right of voting cannot be taken away, but the subjects of voting can be much reduced. In a history of the franchise in 1918, two Yale historians presented the stakes. If the state gives the vote to the ignorant, they will fall into anarchy today and despotism tomorrow. City <laughs> Cities and states outside the South joined their Southern partners to restrict suffrage. They added uh, property, taxpayer, and literacy requirements, lengthened residency requirements, enacted cumbersome registration procedures, shorter polling hours, and the Australian ballot. Nationally, drastic immigration restriction further reduced the potential for working class political power. The exception, of course, to contraction in this era is woman suffrage, which spread um, gradually and then was nationalized in 1920. But part of that movement's success rested on a strategic rejection of earlier demands for universal suffrage in favor of good government arguments, um, rooted in claims that middle class white women voters would help to counteract the votes of corrupt and incompetent African American and immigrant workers. Chapter two, an era of expansion. World War II altered the racial calculus in the United States. 
prompting substantial activism led by African American veterans and lending diplomatic impetus to the cause of voting rights. Federal courts began to strip away some of the legal mechanisms of disenfranchisement. The mass mobilization of African Americans who literally put their lives on the line to demand full citizenship created a political crisis by the 1960s that resulted in a second reconstruction. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 and its subsequent reauthorizations eliminated nearly all formal suffrage restrictions and made the federal government responsible for protecting voting rights. Passed despite virulent opposition by Southern legislators who claimed the bill would lead to despotism and tyranny, the bill prohibited various tactics that states had used to disenfranchise voters. It empowered the U.S. Attorney General to send federal observers and registrars to cover jurisdictions, those jurisdictions that had a history of, um, of disenfranchising African Americans, and required that those states and jurisdictions get federal approval for any future changes in statewide electoral procedures. This is Section 5 preclearance. The act had an immediate and dramatic impact. In 1959, only about a quarter of eligible African Americans were registered to vote in the South. By 1968, 68% were registered. And by 1975, the historian Alexander Kesar claims that the act's provisions had added more than 20 million voters to the rolls. Congress and the court subsequently expanded on the act's promise. In 1966 and 69, the Supreme Court ruled that poll taxes and property and taxpayer requirements violated equal protection. And by the 1980s, federal courts were ruling that individuals experiencing homelessness could establish residency in public places for registration purposes. In 1975, Congress extended the Voting Rights Act to cover language minorities and required translations uh, of registration and polling materials. States began to liberalize voting procedures to increase access, including same-day registration, vote by mail, and early voting. And in 1993, after uh, Republican filibusters throughout the 1980s and a Bush veto in 1992, President Clinton signed the National Voter Registration Act, better known as the Motor Voter Law, which mandated that states make voter registration available by mail and at the Department of Motor, Motor Vehicles and public assistance and social service offices. In less than two years, the act's provision had added an estimated 9 million new voters to the rolls. And chapter three, a new era of contraction. So we're now in the midst of a new era of contraction with motives and methods that are remarkably similar to those of a century ago. By the 1990s, working class and minority voters were building momentum in campaigns to challenge the growing power of corporate capital and neoliberal policymaking. Attention to growing economic inequality was spreading, and a multiracial coalition mobilized to demand immigrant rights, living wage laws, and redistributive policies like health care. Then in 2008, Barack Obama won the presidency with a pledge to address economic inequality through progressive policies in the first presidential election in which black voter turnout was as high as white turnout. Conservative activists and lawmakers nationwide began to claim against all evidence that the United States was suffering from an epidemic of massive voter fraud. They blamed paid democratic operatives and progressive organizations for empowering supposedly ineligible low-income voter and minority voters. The justification for contracting voting rights is also eerily similar to that of a century ago, though perhaps, and I say perhaps, less overtly racist. Low-income and minority voters, restrictionists claim, are the source of corruption and fraud that subvert the democratic process. And just one, uh, a couple brief examples, um, uh, ACORN, which was a or uh, community organization that was predominantly minority, low-income, and, and predominantly women, um, uh, basically was shut down because of these claims of voter fraud, and, and I'll just let you see the images. Um, uh, if you can see, it's clearly an African-American man um, uh, being corrupt, right, trying to um, get fraudulent votes. By the 21st century, conservative activists and legislators, heavily backed by corporate funding, had developed a powerful campaign to contract working class and minority voting rights. 
Organizations like the Voting Integrity Project, which was created in 1996, trained poll watchers to challenge would-be voters at the polls, spearheaded efforts to remove supposedly ineligible voters from the rolls, and lobbied for restrictive legislation. While the corporate-backed American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, developed a model voter restriction bill that Republican legislators introduced across the country. The goal was clear. States with the highest minority voter turnout were the most likely to adopt new voting restrictions that disproportionately disenfranchise minority and low-income citizens. Ten states have made it harder to register to vote. Attacks on voter registration drives, such as stringent criminal penalties for minor mistakes, have made it very difficult for groups to help voters register in many states. And African Americans and Latinos register through drives at twice the rate as whites. Other laws require documentary proof of citizenship when registering, eliminate same-day registration, and make it harder to stay registered when a voter moves. Many states have eliminated or limited early voting, particularly Sundays and evening hours, the times most convenient for working class voters. In 2008, African Americans in southern states began voting early at high rates. Since 2011, the eight states that saw recent surges in early voting by minorities had, had made cuts uh, to early voting periods. Explaining his 2012 vote to limit early voting hours, an Ohio official was surprisingly candid. I guess I really actually feel we shouldn't contort the voting process to accommodate the urban voter turnout machine. <laughs> urban there, of course, meaning African American. Since 2011, 13 states have adopted new voter identification laws, which require that voters present specific types of photo identification. Minority voters are twice, or excuse me, are more likely than white voters to lack the mandated identification. And in this era of mass incarceration, uh, felon disenfranchisement affects nearly 6 million Americans. And here's a, a slide showing we had actually a reduction in felon disenfranchisement in the 1970s and then um, an upswing here. 75% um, of those 6 million who are disenfranchised because of a felon, felony conviction are no longer in prison and are either on probation or parole or have completed their sentences altogether. Here are uh, state, state restrictions you can see. Um, the disproportionate impact on African Americans is undeniable. African Americans of voting age are four times more likely to lose voting rights through felon disenfranchisement than the rest of the population. In several states, including Florida, more than 20% of el eligible African Americans cannot vote due to stringent felon disenfranchisement laws. The Sentencing Project claims that felon disenfranchisement likely affected the results of at least seven Senate races between 1970 and 1998, as well as the infamous 2000 presidential election. And before uh, 2013, court challenges and federal oversight via the Section 5 preclearance provision limited the impact of some of these restrictionist laws uh, because of their disproportionate impact on minority voters. But in 2013, in Shelby County versus Holder, a five-justice Supreme Court majority invalidated the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act and opened the way to a new wave of restrictions. And those are the states that had been covered by Section 5. Um, progressive organizations and activists are pushing back in campaigns like North Carolina's Moral Mondays movement and through legal challenges. Perhaps a third reconstruction is on the horizon, just to end happily. <laughs>